Hello, this is David Mando once again. And today I want to talk a little bit about um, com computer security. I want to add a few comments to the chapter in the book or the um, slide slides that you got on computer security. And um, maybe comment on some of those topics and and add a new take on a few topics. Um, your book and your slides talk a lot about um, um, different types of malware. Um, I, I agree with everything in there. It's um, I will say sometimes I don't don't always worry too much about computer mal or what type of malware it is because it seems to me like so many of the modern attacks are a com are a combination of maybe a virus and a worm and several other things. Um, they're often not just one thing. The um, I don't claim to be an expert on computer security, but computer security is kind of funny. Everybody needs to know something about computer security. That is just simply goes without saying. Today we live in an age where there's a lot of violations of computer security. I grew up in a day and age when we did not worry about computer security. I worked in uh, scientific software. Everybody was nice and friendly. Nobody cared about robbing one another. Everybody was honest. We sent data back and forth unencrypted in the mail, um, over the internet. Um, everybody trusted everybody. We live with some of that history today. That's one of the things that creates some of our problems is people like me way back in the old days when everybody was trustworthy built systems and learned to live with systems that did not have much security built into them and they outgrew um, they outgrew their design as as more bad guys came into being and um, and and we have the problems we do today so you see things like you know the email system that was set up in an before the internet, actually, way back in the 1960s, was not designed to deal with the security needs <laughs> of the modern era by any means. Um, okay, so um, let's talk about a few topics here. The um, the first thing. I had a phone going off in the background here, and um, it was—it's been—it's—it it was disturbing me. Okay, the book talks about things like viruses is attacking your computers, and yes, they do can attack your computers, or they might. Some of them don't do anything, but some of them do attack your computers. They might take information off your computers and send it to. Um, bad guys. They might um, um, delete files. They might do this. They might do that. But they can do things even more insidious than that. Malware, and malware is a general term for any type of malware, viruses, spyware, keyboard loggers, I don't care. Anyway, but malware can do really bad things. One of the things about a computer, just just my little desktop here, or big desktop, whatever, has a program in it called a BIOS, which historically it's a chip and it's kind of got software that is burned into the chip. They did that at manufacturing. So it's hardware. However, with time, we have changed that. So um, because you can't update that unless you go down there and get your soldering hour in and out and change the BIOS uh, chip. So you can't update BIOS of that type unless you actually play with the hardware. Um, like with the soldering iron. 
um, which is kind of like hard, especially if it's built into an existing chip and is not independent of itself. So in order to be able to upgrade those and get rid of flaws in the BIOS, they started making the BIOS as as a, a type of memory where the um, um, the BIOS is actually um, becomes more like software. It's kind of hardware, but it's kind of software. And so you could be you could then change the BIOS by upgrading it, and you would do that by maybe running a program on your computer that can some which way address the BIOS area and what's called flash a new BIOS to the existing BIOS so that they would change the hardware. It would be an upgrade, uh, but it's all done in software by basically flashing the BIOS from your operating system. Um, or I think at one time it was from something they attached to the computer, but it quickly became from your operating system, from say Windows. You can flash your BIOS. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Guess what? That means somebody could write um, a virus-like thing that would um, just be a piece of Windows software or Linux software, I don't care. And it just propagates through as a worm or as a virus, something, as a piece of Windows or, or your operating system stuff. But it's bad thing that it does is every now and then it flashes your BIOS. A certain type of BIOS, if it can figure out what type of BIOS it was, it could flash your BIOS, thus destroying your computer. Because then there's no way to boot the system because the BIOS basically tells the computer system where to go for the hard drive and how to load the operating system. If somebody destroys that, there's no way to boot the computer. So they have effectively destroyed the computer. Ah. Well, if you can do that, you can do all sorts of things because we've got all sorts of intelligent hardware connected to computers nowadays. So possibly you could um, write some sort of software that might be able to do something fancy on some device that's connected to some computer, like um, maybe a Cinefuge that uh, separates U-235 from U-238 uh, uranium for um, uh, uh, doing uranium enrichment for putting it in reactors or atomic bombs or, you know, whatever you do with enriched uranium. Um, actually, radiation is fun to work with, uh, dating back to my high school or to my college physics days but um, but um, the so you could destroy reactors which is exactly what it seems like it was the US and Israel I, I mean nobody's ever admitted it but uh, that which the US and I Israel did with um, the writing of the Stuxnicks um, Stuxnicks a worm, worm slash virus, which destroyed all sorts of Iranian centrifuges, setting their nuclear program back, I guess. Uh, I mean, we think it set them back quite a ways and cost them a lot of money. Or, let's say drones have computers in them. So maybe you could write some sort of thing so that you could take over and land a drone um, in your territory, even though the drone belongs to a, an enemy or, or maybe a neutral party, which is exactly what I, I am told the Iranian military did when they captured an American drone that was flying in Afghanistan, I believe. Well, no, they said it went over to the border into Iran. 
uh, I don't know. Maybe it didn't. Maybe it did. Depends on whose military you ask. <laughs> um, but supposedly they actually landed the drone and uh, without cracking it up too much and, and thus they have all the intelligence from having a working drone. Uh, a working American drone. Okay. Or you could do this with cars. And indeed, we have seen some a prototype things where a car has gotten next to another car and using uh, with a loud and, and the driver of car, you know, car B drives up next to car A. Car B has a guy in the passenger seat with a laptop with uh, 802.11ng whatever turned on with the wireless communication turned on he then starts talking to the computer in car A and before long he is or she is controlling um, car A. They can accelerate it, they can um, uh, decelerate it, they can turn off the motor, they can change the gears, um, maybe put it in reverse, uh, maybe just crash the whole thing, you know, whatever. Um, or I have a friend, um, Karen Sanders, who um, works for, um, well, I, I'm, I used to work for the um, uh, Open um, Free Software Conservancy. I'm not quite sure where she's at now. But uh, Karen wears a, um, she's young, but she wears a heart pacemaker because of a, gene um, a uh, congenital heart deformity. Um, fortunately, it's relatively minor as long as she has a heart pacemaker. Being a hacker, she's of course studied the ins and outs of how you might hack into a heart pacemaker. And what she's found is there's very little security. They they make these talk wireless because you don't want to have to cut into a person every time you want to do a little upgrade or something on the heart pacemaker. So they talk wirelessly to the outside world. And as I understand, they're not very, um, very well protected in terms of security. What does that mean? Well, in my mind, remember a little while ago when uh, the older brother of um, the dictator in um, um, who runs North Korea, Kim Unsong, I, I can't remember his name or can't pronounce it, but, but the dictator that runs North Korea, his older brother um, used to beat around Macau and Singapore and Malaysia and places like that. He was in the airport in Kuala Lumpur and two or three people attacked him with a, um, um, I, I think it was some spray or something, and poisoned him and killed him. Uh, it was a political assassination. Now, indeed, what would be better than just walking by the guy with a cell phone and um, attack, turning his heart pacemaker off? Uh, uh, computer security actually has real world implications. And, and many of which aren't the things we normally think of on a day-to-day -day basis. OK, I um, have another thing here. Uh, it says here, say something about rootkits and, and backdoors. Um, the book talked about rootkits and backdoors. Rootkits are basically, why do we use the word rootkit? Well, in the Unix world, the user, the, the godlike user, the person in charge of everything is by tradition called root and he has an ID number, uh, the UID of zero. And everything in the Unix world is some which way a descendant, a child or grandchild or whatnot of root. So um, the guy that starts the computer, the, the, the prime user is root. If you get the access rights of root, you control everything on a Unix computer. Um, so 
the passwords to root are highly guarded. <laughs> State secrets. Uh, well, I, I mean, they're. So we call it a root kit when somebody breaks into a system and gets root rights. Does it happen? Can it happen? Well, Unix systems are fairly immune from vi normal viruses, but that's not to say they're entirely safe. They get worms, they get Trojan horses, they get, theoretically one could make a virus for one, they're rare. They get, you name it, they do, they can get it. And there is incentive to get to Unix systems because many of the biggest, meanest, um, most valuable computers in the world are Unix or Linux systems. So um, have I ever had a system root kitted? Yeah, I have. I mean, you know, your servers are under attack all the time. I think anybody that's been in this business for a long time has had a system or two root kitted or maybe a hundred or a thousand, I, um, depending on how many you supervise. Um, Got to keep your systems up to date as well as you can to stop that. The book also talked about back doors. Back doors are a little bit deceptive. They shouldn't exist, but back doors aren't quite the same sort of thing as other malware in that back doors are usually designed in the software from day one. You've got a consultant, write some software for you, he wants some way to get in to examine what's going on or something, or maybe he's an evil guy that just wants to make sure he's got power after you fire him. So he writes a back door into this software that only he knows about so he can get in or she can get in after the fact. Um, and they don't tell anyone. Back doors are you know, I think they're bad things. I well, but they do exist. They're all over the place, and of course we have pressure from the government to put back doors into various systems so that the government can surveil people. This is this idea of a back door into our encryption software, and exactly what happens with that often is some. Maybe it's being used for good, legitimate uses, but some bad guy finds the back door because it's a hole. It's there. Somebody finds it, and then you not only have the good guys using it, you've got the bad guys using it, you've got guys you don't know about using it. Um, back doors are dangerous and, sh you know, should never be put into software. They are. Um... Let me go over here so I can read my notes. Okay, keyboard loggers. The keyboard loggers that scare me most are the hardware ones that you just attach on the back of a computer because there's no way around them. You can't change operating systems. You know, changing operating systems doesn't do any good. You still have a keyboard, or some of them are embedded into the keyboard itself. You can't even see it. Um, they're kind of dangerous things. About the only way around it is to bring up a virtual keyboard. Wished I had a virtual keyboard here. Um, I, I just reinstalled my operating system. I don't know what's on it or not on it. But bring up a virtual keyboard where you can point to the letters with using your mouse and then you probably are safe and that's really clumsy but that's good enough to type in a password or something of that type um, so if you've got you know qualms that your keyboard may be being uh, um, um, logged that that's one way around it software keyboard loggers are easier to find and get rid of um, hardware ones are a little scary uh, denial of service attacks. One common attack that is common is just simply a denial of service attack. Let's look at an example of how you might do a denial of service attack. Suppose you had a lot of users on a system. You wanted it to be really very secure. You didn't want people like 
cracking people's passwords and getting on. So you make people change passwords every day and you give a thing if you 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 put in a criteria if people try to log on three times in a row and um, um, then they're locked out for 48 hours. Um, after the third bad attempt you're locked out of the system. Okay. Well suppose you're a bad guy. You know you can then get anyone you want locked out of the system as long as you know their username. If you know everybody's username on the system, you go in. For each user, you try to log on three times with some sort of fakey keyboard. Nobody can use the system for two days. Um, well, unless the system's administrator has a workaround so, you know, can undo that. But that is a denial of service attack. Many denial of service attacks, what they do is they find lots and lots of computers all over the world that they put root kits or something on and they take them over so that they can use these systems. And then all of a sudden, all of them start sending information or looking at the web page of one company. And suddenly, there is so much traffic going to and from that company that there's no internet bandwidth left and you have essentially denied them services. And then they try to get around that by putting in another route. Um, I, I mean, the, the ISP will try to put in a, another route to the system, but that might not work because if, you, if the attacker is looking at the DNS all the time, you pretty much have to update the DNS. Uh, that's the thing that, um, that's the server that says Google is at IP number such and such. Um, if you don't up update that, nobody can see it. If you do update it, the bad guys can see it because it's public information. So denial of service attacks are tough attacks to deal with. Fortunately, I've never had to deal with many of those. But people that are, you know, like the um, head administrators of companies like Google, Amazon, um, Netflix, they've got to deal with those all the time. And uh, they're, they're a bit hard. Um, Phishing and DSP spoofing, or DNS spoofing. Uh, well, phishing, I think the book describes, um, we, we know about. DNS spoofing is something that the book didn't talk about. Sometimes people will try to um, come up with some sort of system where a lot of people, instead of looking at the real official DNS server to get the name of where to um, uh, um, or to get the IP of where they should be routing to, they will try to insert a fake DNS server um, and then use that to um, block out certain sites or put up uh, certain fake sites that look like a real site so that they can capture your uh, um, uh, credit cards or whatnot. DNS spoofing is done quite a bit, maybe in school districts where they're trying to protect people against pornography and other bad sites. Um, you know, <laughs> the entire nation of China <laughs> has been kind of spoofed with uh, by the Great Wall of China. Uh, they, uh, not the, not the one made out of stone and rock and and. Uh, but the one made out of computers that is supposed to keep the Chinese population uh, safe from knowledge or something. Um, OK. So if you find one of these, one's first impulse, you get a denial of service attack, you get this attack, you get that attack, let's counterattack. We know where the guy is. He's flooding us with data. Let's, let's get the guy. OK. That's a bad idea. Because chances are 99 in 100 that the guy doing the attack 
was just some poor guy whose computer was taken over by the real person. There is an awful lot of false flags and um, I, it's routine. The way you, if you're a, a cracker, system cracker, don't ever get caught. The way you don't get caught is that you hide your trail through other people's computers. You leave this huge, ugly, wormy trail where they just can't figure out that you were the original attacker. And, and that's what's typically done. So anytime somebody counterattacks, they manage to attack the wrong person. So if there's somebody out there that you really don't like, use their computers to attack somebody else you really don't like. They will then counterattack one another and life will be wonderful uh, while your enemies fight. Um, okay. Um, next thing is um, spyware and adware. The book talks about this very uh, quite well. Um, I don't think the book was explicit enough about this. A great deal of spyware, and, you know, we talk about spyware and adware because it's kind of bad stuff done by nasty people who uh, we don't care about. But then we download, we go to social media sites, uh, we download a free Android or iPhone apps. Um, Aren't those just spyware or adware? They're sending our information to God knows who. They're sending us ads that we don't really want. Well, I guess we said we'd get them, but we don't really want them. Um, so there's an awful lot of what I call legitimate. It's nothing legitimate about it, but it's, well, they say it's legitimate. Legitimate spyware and adware. Be careful when you download Android apps. My experience with a lot of these apps on Google Play hasn't been all that good. There is a site called F-Droid where everything is quality open source, or at least most of it is. There, it's very limited on what's there, but I trust it much more. Uh, and there are good, many, many good apps on Google Play. I'm just saying there's a lot of trash too. Um, the whole social media idea, you know, um, uh, I, I admit to using Facebook, but, uh, um, uh, I don't like it, but, but, but everybody uses it, so I've got to use it because everybody else uses it, and then other people use it because I use it, and, and we're trapped. Um, not, it's not good. Uh, there's surveillance cameras every place. Um, actually, if, if you have never read the, some of the works by George Orwell and um, Huxley, uh, dating way back to the 1950s, it, read their work. Particularly read uh, 1984 and, and, and Animal Farm. Those are marvelous works that describe the world we live in. Uh, they don't describe the world in 1984 as much as they describe the world we live in today, where everybody is spied on all the time. And, you know, think about that when you think about buying child monitors. Are you taking away your children's freedom? I, I mean, we all want to guard our children, uh, or at least our grandchildren. But, um, but we need to have some limits so that they can learn on their own too, and sometimes learn. You know, um, learning experiences aren't always pleasant. <laughs> People have to make mistakes to learn. Okay. Uh, in, along the same lines as spyware and adware is scareware. The book does kind of a nice job with scareware. I think scareware is prevalent in our whole society um, e everywhere. Um, 
you know, they sell us surveillance systems because we're all afraid of burglars and bad people coming in and beating us up. Still, the crime rate's as low as it's ever been. Um, they, um, that's why half the people in the world that buy guns buy guns. Uh, there are other good reasons to buy guns and own guns, but self-protection is not one of them. Uh, I, I mean, um, I'd get shot before I ever found my gun. It's, it's, uh, um, a lot of stuff is sold on fear. Actually, dating way back to the 1950s or 60s when they had people going around selling sets of encyclopedias, the, the scare tactic was your children. Think about your children. Your children will be second class citizens. They will flunk out, fail in school. They will. If they don't have a set of world book encyclopedias, well, that's the end. Um, so, you know, scare, well, we see it in politics all the time. Both parties, um, all parties, it's, you know, it's the way we sell things. And it's used in software a great, great, de great deal, uh, a huge amount. How to protect yourself? Well, common sense is the first place to start. The book talks a little bit about user accounts. A user accounts in the Windows world traditionally have not been very good. DOS did not have user accounts, MS-DOS, or CPM, or many of the other early operating systems. Uh, the user, uh, user account was a, um, the key to the computer or the key to the door, that they, uh, it to the room the computer was in. Uh, today, all systems have user accounts, but Windows has been very weak on its user account system because it seems like they always build a system where you have to be you have to have administrative rights to be able to actually do anything. So uh, that's the same as being root on a Unix system. As soon as you um, get too many rights, then user accounts uh, don't have the force to protect, or they can't protect you. Uh, if they don't limit you, they can't protect you. Uh, in recent years, the last few revisions of Windows have been really much, much, much improved over earlier versions of Windows in terms of computer security and enforcing reasonable restrictions on user accounts. Um, I, you know, I, I have not studied or looked at Windows 10 in much detail, but it looks rather good to me. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. In the Unix world and much in the mainframe world, some of the operating systems like, um, um, oh, the DOS or the, the, the DEC operating systems, um, be, well, they're dead now, so I won't worry about them. Or Kranos or a lot of those operating systems, the IBM mainframe operating systems dating way, way, way back. User accounts were enforced from day one. And uh, like in a Unix system, you don't have many, by default, you don't really have many rights to write outside of your own area. You don't have rights to change the system software unless you root. You don't have rights to do this and that. So if you did get a virus, it doesn't have rights to write on bad parts, uh, on key parts of the system. All it can do is screw up your files. It can't really screw up the system's files. It can't screw up, if there's 55 people that have accounts on that system, it can't screw up all their accounts. So user accounts are a key to protecting, uh, to making systems that fight malware. Um, it's really hard to, for malware to defeat user accounts. It can be done. I just said Unix has lots of problems with worms and whatnot. 
Um, one of the things about Unix people is the Unix ad systems administrators, people like me, get on and they have the access rights of, uh, and this is because they're, because of the tradition, my access rights are the access rights of somebody called D. Mandel. Um, and it's this UID, and that's all the rights I have. Um, maybe I have one or two other accounts I could log off and log on as that. And of course, I can log on as root because I am the systems administrator, but I never do things as root unless I need the authority as root. Um, uh, and that's the fundamental rule is never violate the access rights or they don't work for you. Uh, firewalls, virus scans, etc. Um, I'm a big believer in fire, firewalls. I, I don't, you know, don't just protect your computer with a vir firewall. Well, if you have a company computer, don't protect it by putting firewall software on the machines or, or getting a corporate firewall do all of that. I'm a big believer in putting in multiple layers of firewalling. I firewall everything. I put a firewall on every one of my my personal computers uh, around the house, my Windows machines, my Linux machines, my Net B, uh, OpenBSD machines. They all have firewalls. And then I put in a, a router that kind of has a firewall built into it. And when I'm really serious, I put in a corporate firewall between just on my home system, um, a Linux-based firewall between the router to the internet and my internal um, networks, or maybe even a couple of them, depending on things, because I usually needed what's called a DMZ. Um, a, a firewall's DMZ is the demilitarized zone, and that's where you put things that have limited public access, like um, like your web servers, and uh, um, they they're you don't let them creep out on your internal network because somebody could do bad things. Okay. Um, Oh, the other thing along those lines is on every machine always um, make sure you don't have any services closed, uh, uh, open or uh, running that you're not using. I find sometimes I walk into a place and I find people have Apache running. Apache is the web server in Unix or Windows world, uh, yeah, but you, mostly in Unix world. Um, and they'll have it open, meaning there's internet access to that machine that could, that's a potential hole, and they don't even know it's open. In fact, um, IBM in Oregon did a, an, a, 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 some sort of upgrade or something a while back, and they found, you know, a dozen web servers on their campus that nobody knew about. Many of them were part of a research program that had been closed down a year ago or whatnot, but the web service still kept running. And so it's not a problem just for us small home people or small business people. It's a problem for everybody. Uh, keep track of things and close, close things, at least temporarily, that aren't being used while they're not being used. Um, I may, I don't know if I should say this in a class like this or not. Another thing I do is, or, or that, well, I do, and I'm not a computer guy. I'm not a security person. I'm an applications person. I, but, but every Unix system, every systems administrator has to understand basic level security. So even people that are not, that claim not to be security people, uh, that means I couldn't get a job as a good high-level security person. I do understand, you know, everybody needs to understand security at a certain level. A, a systems administrator needs to understand it pretty well. 
but that doesn't mean I can necessarily deal with a bad attack without bringing in a real expert. Um, so, what was I going to say? Well, in, anyway, one of the things I was going to say, the idea of firewalling every place and protecting yourself every place, it's something called security in depth. Many of these security hassles are just small hassles. A real system cracker can get all through them so quickly. But it might trip him up. And if he's got to go through a lot of them, if one of them trips him up, he's screwed. You got him. So it's often better to have layers of security than one super tight system if you have layers where they have to jump through a lot of stuff, um, including some stuff that maybe is, <laughs> is pretty weak but and some stuff that is much more solid. That really gives them nightmares. Um, also, you need to keep everything up to date. We were talking about virus scans. Virus scans are only as good as the virus definitions. So if you don't keep your virus scan software up to date, um, it won't be able to detect a lot of the newer viruses. Um, virus scans, they make them for Unix systems. They make them for Windows systems. Uh, they do, modern ones do catch worms and certain things that will attack Unix systems. But the primary use of virus scans, I think, on Unix systems is that the Unix systems will do things like be a mail server or a web server. And they will be a repository for things that end up on Windows machines. So you want to catch the Windows viruses while they're on the Unix machine before they ever get to the Windows machine. So a lot of the scanning for viruses on a Unix machine is actually scanning for Windows viruses, not scanning for Unix viruses. Um, now they do do some scanning for, I mean, they're going to look for anything they can. OK, the next thing is, um, let's take a quick look here at our time. OK, the next thing I want to talk about is um, just a little bit is books, everything I always say, get your data, get your software from trusted sources. I fully agree with that. Um, I may disagree a little bit on what trusted sources are, but I fully agree. Don't get your stuff from sources you don't trust. Um, I had a little personal experience with a computer that had been around for several years. My wife used it. It had never picked up anything. It, it was not that well protected, but you know, she always went to sites she trusted. And she used it a lot, but always using it with sites she trusted. Things she knew what she knows what she's doing. We had a friend visit us from another country, and uh, he uh, he needed a computer to use. That she let him use her computer, and within a couple of weeks, that thing was so filled with viruses. It was filled with this. It was filled with that. Um, it was such a mess. Um, it's just a matter of what sites you visit, what you do. Um, in my mind. Uh, most of the real, quote unquote, real proprietary software is pretty good. It, it I consider it a trusted site. I, I trust Microsoft. I trust Microsoft Office. I, I, I more or less. I trust um, Windows. I trust um, Adobe, um, ESRI. Um, SAS, you know, they're, 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 they're good trusted sites. The cheaper ones are a little, you know, I'm a little less leery, more leery of them. They're likely to put some adware in or something. You ever buy a commercial, uh, one of these consumer grade Windows computers from a computer store? They're filled with adware. I, I mean, you bring up the screen, you boot the screen with the, the consumer grade Windows, 
it's nothing but little pictures of how you buy something else to go on your machine. It's, okay, uh, enough said. So maybe, uh, maybe I'm too trusting there. Um, there's another category of proprietary software called freeware. Um, freeware because it, it's called freeware because it's um, be, uh, free of charge. They don't charge you for it. Um, it's not open source. It's not what. It's not good software. They don't give you the source code. They don't give you access to the source code. They usually give you a broken version, and then they say you can upgrade to their premium version that has no ads or no whatever. Um, I really. Uh, that's the worst of all possible worlds. I don't trust that type of software very much. I avoid it as much as I can. I really don't like it. In my mind, the gold standard of software is probably open source software from official open source sites. The GNU people, any of the leading distributions, open source, oh, open source, Fedora, uh, 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 Ubuntu, uh, Red Hat, or Fedora. Um, um, well, there's hundreds of these. Or any, or they have uh, uh, Nopix, um, and they have mirrors on many, many university sites. That's all trusted, good software. Um, and they do actually have mirrors on quite a few commercial sites that are decent worthy sites as well. I put less faith in those, but I've never been um, I, I've never been burned by one of them. So you know, but open source software is very trustworthy. People in the closed source world don't always recognize that, so books and stuff don't really always reflect that, but it's good stuff. Um, and someday I'll make a video on it. Um, okay, the last line of defense, and I left. I'm covering this last, not because it's least important, but because it's most important, is backups and archives. Okay, backups and archives are crucial to keeping secure. They will defeat almost any security problem. Viruses, uh, worms, spyware, atomic bombs destroying cities that you're in. Um, good backups and archives can defeat all of that. Um, sometimes with tr trouble, but, but they, they, they can. Back up your systems, back them up regularly, and you know I would make recommendations. I I'm, don't know about Windows, but I usually back up using um, oh some sort of Unix copy software. A tar is a tape archive that is a good backup system. It's often nowadays used on things other than tape, or I make industry standard DVDs, um, industry standard, not a proprietary DVD or not a proprietary tape, they're industry standard. So I don't need a, uh, the stuff I made on some proprietary, on SEO Unix, which hasn't been made in many, many years. I can read on the machine I'm using right now because it was made with industry standard backups. Uh, I'm not a big believer in, in um, proprietary commercial backup systems because as soon as the company goes out of business, you've lost it all. Archives are a little different than backups because archives are meant to be longer term than backups. Backups are important. Archives is sort of like a backup to the backup. So it's like if all hell breaks loose, you still have this information. It, they're often hard to make because you really, really, really want them to be as oh prone to change, uh, um, 
stable to change as, as anything. I mean, the ultimate in archives are cuneiform clay tablets. We can read those, uh, what, 4,000, 6,000 years after they were written. Now, clay, maybe they should have made them out of stone. Clay breaks too easily. But, you know, and cuneiform is a little hard to read, but we know how to read those. So, um, archives may have to be printed material um, on vellum or something. Uh, uh, um, I mean, it depends on your situation. Most of us make archives on digital material. I really don't trust that we'll be able to read them in the future. In my lifespan, I have seen, well, let's see. Don't have one at my fingertips, but you know, I've got floppy disk laying around here. I've got those big five and a half inch floppy, uh, five and a quarter inch, five and a half inch, five and a quarter inch floppies. I might have some eight inch floppies. I may have some paper tape from the old days. You think I could find a paper tape reader today? Um, you know, things change. Um, DVDs have been real, uh, CDs and DVDs have been great for a long time, but they're going out of style at this point in time. Uh, they will be hard to read in not too long. I've got lots and lots of nine track tapes. Well, I've gotten rid of most of mine. I've got a nine track tape reader and I can read people's nine track tapes. A lot of them, a lot of the data on nine track tapes is 20, 30 years old and it's, um, um, the magnetics in the tapes have leaked from one band to another, so a lot of them have a lot of errors and stuff, but I have a tape drive that can read those. And I still have a computer that I could connect it to. It's an old ancient computer, but it would work. Um, anyway, backups are really crucial and really important. The uh, uh, And they don't get enough. They're not sexy. So they don't get enough attention and enough funding and, 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 and attention. It's a lot easier to get money to put up a new building than to put on a new roof. But a new roof will do a lot more to protect your assets than a new building. It's the same thing with computer security. It's really cool to talk about viruses and and worms and and all of these cool things, but what really attacks people? Where do we really lose data? Hard disk crashes. I lost two terabytes the other day on a hard disk crash. Uh, why am I not crying? I had a good backup. Um, the other, ma another major, major, major loss of data or important files is these fingers. I typed RM for remove and I meant to type MV for move, but instead I hit the carriage return with this finger and um, suddenly I removed uh, a two gigabyte video uh, uh, or or something. That's kind of bad. I could have my hard disk rated. I could have super protection. And what would happen? Well, I'd have multiple copies on different disks and it would erase both of them for me. <laughs> The only salvation I have is yesterday's backup um, or last week's backup or whatever. I mean, there are many, many, many times the biggest, biggest losses that the most common losses backups will protect you. So, you know, and I see this, I go into places and they don't want to pay somebody to make backups. They don't want to pay for automated backups. They don't want to, but backups are seriously important. Not and and I will say the book talks about automated backups or something like that. Automated backups are cool. Hey, I 
I've written automated backup systems for uh, for trucking companies, actually. Uh, so they're really cool if I wrote them. Um, backup system, automated backup systems are cool. I use automated backup systems. Backup system, uh, automated backup systems are, are good. But don't forget about the system because they do take maintenance. They do take um, hand holding. One of the things you have to do with any, any, any good backup system is what I call war games. Test the system. Once a month, once every now and then, somebody has to delete a file, call computer operations, or call me if, if it's my computer, you know, I, I got to test my backups, and um, get, get that file back. Um, it's really, really important because I, I, I was once I once went into a company that had rows of backups all around the office, rows and rows and rows on shelves all around the office. They called me in because they couldn't find a file. It was a big, huge, important database uh, that they were missing. It was one file, but it was you know. It was the database file in their system. I looked, I started loading tapes. I looked at, they, these were done on magnetic tapes, but I started loading tapes. I looked on a lot of their tapes. The file didn't exist. It wasn't there. I looked at the software making the um, backup. Intuitively, it was not made the way I would have made it, uh, the software, but also I could not find a problem. I couldn't find any reason it was not making the backup properly. Intuitively, it didn't feel quite like it should have, but it, it was still, it was okay, I, I think. But something was going wrong. Um, it's like the database didn't get closed and the new thing, um, the database should have been getting closed every night just before the backup was made and then the backup would grab this file and the backup wouldn't grab a file that was open. Um, and the database was... I, it was it was in the scheduler. It was supposed to be closed. I bet that's what fa was failing is that the scheduler wasn't closing that thing properly or something. I, I don't know. Anyway, to make a long story long uh, or short, or I finally trained one of the secretaries to load backup tapes and look at the tapes because their time was a lot cheaper than my time. Um, and I kept looking at things and I couldn't find anything and you know I was called in after the fact and um, I, I it was it was a sad experience because you had people all oh, they were really down and they had and what was sad is they had been so dedicated about making their backups they had done everything right except they hadn't played war games. They hadn't actually tried to use the backups. They had been making them for years without trying to use them. And um, they did not work when they were needed. And that was, you know, that was rather sad. That was, um, um, that was actually a company in the Portland area. I, uh, For the sake of privacy, I don't remember what part of Portland. There's a lot of companies in Portland, so. Um, but it was, uh, you know, wasn't a cheerful event. So, make backups, test your backups. And if you fail on everything else with computer security, make the backups and hope for the best. Uh, backups won't protect you from everything because once you get a virus on things, then the virus goes on to the backups and, you know, things get messy. I meant to also talk about a couple other things such as log files, but I forgot those. They were further back in my talk. Um, so we will um, skip those and... Um, I'll leave it at that so
Bye-bye.